So um, we're going to extend this. We've kind of touched on a little bit of this conversation about diversity from the a little bit few examples there of some soil health benefits and changes. And we'll kind of extend that into thinking about diversity for pests and disease um, <clears throat> prevention. And then um, we'll move on to talk a little bit about nutrition and um, biology a bit there as well. Okay, so this was our kind of um, introductory message there. It's about the role of plants in also helping the role of soils or the function of soils. And it's this point about multifunctionality that I made. With plant species diversity, you bring multiple functions, and that really helps the agricultural ecosystems perform more functions. We, particularly here in the UK with this discourse around public um, food, public goods, public money, public goods, all of that kind of conversation. Um, moving forward, we're here, especially an interesting case study, um, looking at making the agricultural systems multifunctional, that looking for them to produce food and to take care of the landscapes in which they sit. And generally, we would say that our intensive kind of agriculture focused land is, yes, it's very good at being productive, but not so good at maybe doing some of these other things. Natural ecosystems are very good at these other things, but they're not normally so productive. So it's about trying to find this middle ground. Can we redesign our farming systems to, to still be productive, but also to be multifunctional? And really the key tool in which we can use to create this multifunctionality is plant species diversity. So if you can just get more diversity in all sorts of different ways, this is what's going to help drive some of those other ecological benefits, ecosystem services, these types of other things. It can at least be a part of that puzzle. And that could be as simple as wider rotations, you know, novel cash crops and using a wider rotation, diversity through time, which is still useful. Um, annuals, perennial. So if you're an annual arable system, if you can have a perennial phase in the rotation, um, this is going to bring the benefits of perennials into those annual plants. And again, I think there's a great conversation happening here in the UK about livestock integration in the arable rotation. It's, um, there's a good conversation, good resources on that. And I think that's um, one of the good discussions I'm, I'm hearing here. <clears throat> but also, if you were a perennial system, could you make use of some of the annu annuals? Um, they also are different plants. They do different things. Can we do some a bit of annual grazing, for example? Summer, winter, it's that same point. We're very temperate, kind of dominant, cool season plants here in the UK. So can we use some summer covers, bring in some of the C3 plants, sunflower, maize, sorghum, other, other warm season plants. Um, they're different plants. They do different things. They bring different benefits. So can we kind of use some summer plants in our generally um, cool season dominant growing systems? And then we have the covers, as we kind of touched on a little bit earlier. Um, that's bringing diversity in the temporary kind of pieces of time post-harvest. So those catch crops and, and winter cover crops um, can be beneficial. And then maybe the more practical way to at least get a bit more diversity in the arable cropping phase is through those companions or intercrops. <clears throat> and then some of the other non-productive areas, your biodiversity zones, um, biodiversity strips, flower strips, beetle banks, all of the kind of field margins just taking some of those areas and um, you know, cre creating habitat for the biodiversity, for the insects, et cetera. Uh, I think especially relevant maybe in some of your lower producing areas, some low points in the field or part areas that are getting down to water courses. If they generally just are not good producing, um, you know, why push the issue? Why force the issue? Um, if it's a low point, it always sits waterlogged. Just put it to some permanent perennial cover and just leave it. Let those permanent roots create drainage and channels and tunnels to kind of prevent some of that water. Just hand it over to the ecosystem. There can be benefits um, in doing that, <clears throat> that feed back into the productive areas, as I'll share some quick examples um, in a second. And then trees, of course, agroforestry, or trees and pastures and animals. Can we have integrate these together? Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for trees. It's not just about rewilding. Um, I think there's really better uses of trees that can be, yes, provide ecosystem function and be pr and support production at the same time. And I think that um, a more maybe nuanced conversation about trees would also be valuable. Um, trees that are also functional to, um, from a productivity point of view as well, <clears throat> as well as trees um, for their other ecological benefits. I think there's, there's room for both conversations. Um, okay, so it can be as simple as uh, just some grass areas, some grass strips, uh, especially if we can get some tall grasses, this creates to, helps to create a more a high rise for the insects, more real estate for them to, to pack in. So uh, if we can get some, particularly some of the taller grass species and tall plants um, and just have them as strips or in our field margins as providing 
habitat for the beneficials. But if we can add some flowers into that, even better. Here we, here we see an example of um, <clears throat> beneficial spiders on the left and other beneficial insects, kind of specific um, generalists and specialists. And you're comparing brown, bare soil, green is with some grass cover, and purple is with some flowers. So anything is better than bare soil. That's where even grass, it seems to help. It will improve, whoops, um, improve the beneficials just by having green plants, green cover as compared to bare soil. But if we can add flowers, typically we see <clears throat> more benefits over and above that. Okay, so that can be some of the benefit. Just a nice visual example, um, visual cue here, a nice facilia strip through the middle of this oat crop, providing space, habitat, breaking up the monoculture, um, providing habitat for those beneficials to migrate onwards into the, um, into the cropping areas and provide some of those ecosystem services. Um, just as an example, you know, I do think the Innovative Farmers Project here in the UK is outstanding. I think it is a fantastic resource. You're very lucky to have this. I've seen they've just recently started something very similar in Canada. Um, and it's just this idea of farmer-led research, bringing together researchers with practitioners, um, actually having, giving farmers the opportunity to input and steer the research agenda. I think this is absolutely fantastic. Um, and there's lots of good examples. You can surf that website and find all the various projects that have been done. I think it's absolutely fantastic. One small example of this, um, this was from a um, flowering field mar strip and looking at how it can benefit um, um, the pest management, integrated pest management. So they found that where they included a flower strip, there was less aphids. Where there was no flower strip, there was more aphids in the cropping area. So again, just that kind of example of kind of deterring them. Some of those flowers and things not only attract in beneficials, but also can help to deter. But interestingly, just as an example to show that it doesn't always pan out, um, but there's a good explanation why they also found that parasitoid wasps, the beneficials, were also higher with where there was no flower margin. But of course, that's because there was more food. There was more aphids there. So there was more food source. So of course, there was more of them in there eating that food source. So in that example, the flower strip didn't necessarily enhance the, ben the numbers of those beneficials. But there are many other studies that show that they do. So it is a good sound strategy, but just a nice interesting example from this basic kind of field trial um, that demonstrated that maybe the food source was the more important factor driving the attraction of the beneficials. But anyway, that, that aside, just a nice little example specific here. And again, just a plug for the Innovative Farmers Project. So then in terms of using uh, diversity to help manage pests and disease, there's kind of three ways we can think about this, three dimensions to this diversity. One is temporal or time, so diversity through time. And that's, as you all are well aware, it's just rotation. So yes, we have a monoculture here, but we're moving that monoculture through a rotation over time, uh, bringing in the diversity in the, what, of what grows in that field over time. And then we have spatial, and this is, and visually you can see here, we're physically trying to separate out the plants. So we can have, as an example here, it could be alternate rows of an intercrop, pea cereal, pea cereal, whatever it might be, just as an example, or pea uh, or seed rate. Um, so we have alternate, or it could even be strips. It could be six meter strips of one, six, uh, three meter strips of one, three meter strips of one, and alternating. So point being, you're just physically separating, so spatially separating out the plants to create um, that diversity through, through space. So that's your kind of other way to think about this. And then uh, lastly, the genetic diversity. So this is really referring to then things like variety blends, some of those cultivar blends, where it might be a monoculture of wheat, but we might have three or four different varieties in there with all those different kind of strengths and weaknesses and susceptibilities to pests or disease, et cetera. And we blend it all up um, to kind of create more diversity, to create more confusion. And really, <clears throat> there's not necessarily anything magical about this, apart from just this point that what we're trying to do with that spatial diversity or genetic diversity is just break up the monotony, create barriers between the same things, the barriers but to put something else between that same thing again. And this really just helps to break up the monoculture, which makes it harder then for the pest or disease to spread. Here we have the same plant, and it's typically the same variety of the same plant. If, that plant, if those plants are susceptible to that disease that's blowing in on the wind or that insect pest that comes in, if they are susceptible, they are all susceptible. So if we start off in that corner, it will of course just spread like wildfire. They're all uniform. The pests will move through there very easily. Everyone is vulnerable. 
if we can just break that up with some other non-hosts, 50% of the population now are non-hosts, now it's harder for the pest or disease to get to um, the other one that they're chasing um, because we've physically broken that up. We've spatially separated, we've lowered the population density, so we're not so many plants either, so we're diluting the susceptible plant, we're diluting our host through these other plants, be it other plant species or other plant varieties that also may have that resistance. So if we can stack these on together and do rotations with intercropping, with diverse mixtures, there can be some um, <clears throat> very cool advantages to this. So just as one example, it doesn't have to be like this, but I'm just sharing this as an example. It's a seven-way variety wheat blend that you can see here. Um, usually three or four is sufficient, uh, but this was just an example of a farmer in Ireland who was um, doing some save seed and um, keeping his various um, varieties there. So just as, as a nice kind of visual example. And really, again, it's just that point about where really what we're doing is diluting the host plants. We're diluting, these are all uniform, these are all the same, these are all susceptible, if they're susceptible. Um, and here we're just trying to confuse the signals, make it harder, because if it's a radish um, white fly or something, just making something up here. Um, of course, it's, it's, it's infecting this plant and it's got to kind of get through all these to get to the next one. So we're kind of separating and diluting, and then you add some of these other plants, which can also then sometimes be releasing smells and scents and signals that can also confuse that pest and hide that pest as well. So there are other benefits to that. Here's a nice example of this. We're looking at um, increasing plant species diversity and the effects of this on pathogens. So firstly, let's start here on this bottom axis here. We are increasing plant species diversity from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8 to 16 onwards to 60. So we're increasing plant species diversity. And we're looking at how that impacts on the pathogen diversity. And of course, if we have a more diverse number of host plants, we'll have a greater diversity of pathogens that will grow there because there's more different hosts. And so of course, some pathogens are specific to specific hosts. So the more host, different hosts we have, actually we're inviting in a greater diversity of pathogens. So yes, the pathogen diversity increases as we increase plant species diversity. However, if we then look at the ability of those pathogens to cause disease, their overall infectivity and how well they can spread and cause disease, as we increase plant species diversity, their disease pressure is declining. Okay, so the actual infectivity, although they're there, there's more of them there, or greater diversity of them there, their ability ultimately to actually cause economic damage declines. And again, there's nothing super special about this. Um, it's just a dilution effect. Let's use a 16 ways as an example. If I'm the um, pathogen and I land on my susceptible plant here, now I'm looking for the next one. And I've got to count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 17, 14, 15, before I can find my 16th plant over here. Ah, here's my next host. And boom, I'm going to cause disease here. And then I'm surrounded by all these 15 other non-hosts who I can't cause disease on. And so it's nothing special, it's just really diluting the susceptible host, mixing up the signals, putting other non-hosts there, just breaking a barrier, slowing the spread. We're not stopping, this is not control pest and disease. It does not control, but it definitely helps to, dare I say it, slow the spread. Um, it helps to, to at least just slow the spread of those, um, uh, of those pathogens, etc. Okay, that's really it, that's the key mechanism. It's nothing fancy or special. There can be other mechanisms that are fancy and special, like some of these volatile compounds um, that can confuse insects and have other kind of more specific modes of action. But um, generally, it's just really a, a, a physical barrier breaking it up. Okay, so in terms of beneficial insects, here's another study looking at this. Um, so this is a meta-analysis. This is meaning this is just a study that looked at lots, what lots of other studies did and kind of brought them all together and kind of analyzed them and reanalyzed them as one data set and tried to look for overall trends and patterns across all those different studies that might have had different soil types, different contexts, all sorts of different variables. We try to cut through all of that and find the overarching kind of trends and patterns. That's essentially what a meta-analysis will do. So we're summarizing here um, 351 studies and we're finding that as we increase plant species diversity, this will reduce herbivore abundance. When I say herbivore, I mean insect herbivore. So we are reducing pest abundance. By increasing plant species diversity, there are less pests around. But, and they do this through um, increase of predators and parasitoids, and this ultimately increases plant performance. So with more plant species diversity, we have less pests, more beneficials, and better plant performance. And so it's also true of insects. We see many other studies that would support this kind of idea that um, 
plant species diversity can also help us with both insect and disease pressure. And I squeeze this one in here, it's not totally directly relevant, but still um, about benefits of diversity to soil physics. And this is the discussion we had about soil structure and high rainfall environments. And I include, include this because, of course, if you've got a plant sitting in wet soil and it's got wet feet, of course, it's going to be pretty unhappy. It's going to stress that plant. It's going to become more vulnerable to pest and disease attack if it's, if it's um, stressed and unhappy. So I think soil conditions, soil physical condition is also an important point here um, to try and maintain good structure so that we don't have waterlogged soils. This is just inviting stress, inviting pest and disease pressure. Um, so here we have a, um, a study looking at diversity on soil structure, particularly aggregation. So both in glasshouse and field studies, we show that high plant diversity in grassland systems increases soil aggregate stability, a, vi a vital structural property of soil in which root traits play the main driving role of. So that's those aggregates that I talked about earlier, that ball, that sphere that's all stuck together, capturing carbon in there was our example. Well, those, some of those aggregates can be very tightly bound, some more weakly bound. So this is what they're saying, the stability, the, the, the tightness or the strength of that aggregate um, is improved by more plant species diversity. And just one small example, even going from one to two, I shared this, we kind of talked about this there. Um, this is maize and faba bean, and we're looking at the production of these aggregates. And they found that the prevalence of these macro aggregates in the intercropping systems, just having two roots instead of one, that those two root systems interacting and the interaction there increased the aggregate production anywhere from 15 up to just under 60 percent. So 15 to 60 percent increase in aggregate production just from having two root systems versus a monoculture. Coupled with that, the benefits to this potentially the strength of those aggregates, we're hoping to improve the physical condition, the porosity of the soil. The porosity is going to let that water in and drain, but also let all of the gaseous move in and out, the oxygen and carbon dioxide coming in and out, for example. So again, I put that as a still, I think, relevant to plant stress and therefore pest and disease. So just again, visual example of this. Um, uh, we have a, pup, me, uh, a pea mustard um, intercrop here, and we are spatially separating them. These are alternate rows. It doesn't have to be alternate rows. Um, many, many farmers in Canada are doing the intercropping and it's just mixed all in one row. So in that one row, you've got the mixture of the populations. This also helps. Um, plenty of good studies support this, that that is still a useful technique. But the alternate row just is a nice visual for you all to see. And this is the same field just earlier on and later on. Um, and you can see, obviously, as the disease is blowing in, as this example, and it's landing on its host plant on the, on the mustard here, um, as it grows and reproduces and sporulates, it produces spores. You know, those spores are moving out into non-host area. We have a barrier that we're trying to break up and just, again, slow that spread. It's not going to control it, but it's just going to slow. And sometimes slowing and just slowing things down can be a big advantage. What if you know you have a hot spell coming next week? There's going to be two weeks of hot sunny weather, but you might be in a high wet part right now and there's a bit of high humidity, high disease pressure zone. Um, you know that this hot weather is probably going to slow, stop that. The pathogen will probably you know, die out or be, be suppressed by those higher temperatures, etc. So sometimes just slowing the spread can be advantageous because it's just going to help you keep that pathogen contained until the good weather arrives, until you know you'll be out of this vulnerable window. So it can help add resilience in those particular vulnerable, highly susceptible windows where pest and disease pressure can be a problem. Okay, so that's the essence of the argument with diversity. There's kind of many different ways to kind of think about that and manage that, be that grasslands, crop, etc. We kind of shared some various examples as we went along. Um, whichever way in which we can increase the diversity, the better. And this is part of an integrated pest and disease management approach, and I would argue should be the first line of defense, designing with diversity. Start on the right foot. We then have this conversation, which we'll move on to about other strategies we can use to manage pest and disease, like biologicals, biofertilizers, some of these microbial type things, or nutrition. And I'm going to share examples of these, optimizing plant nutrition. And these are imperfect tools. They're not perfect. And to be fair, so are our pesticides, so are our fungicides. These are also imperfect tools. These tools do not work 100% of the time, all of the time. And that's the point of the integrated strategy, is that they're all imperfect, and if we can integrate all of these imperfect tools together, then overall the outcome will be beneficial and positive. And I think that for all of those imperfect tools to work better, it actually 
If you start off with the right foot, design with diversity, break up the monotonous monoculture to begin with, create an environment in which it is not so conducive to pest and disease spread, you're starting off on the right foot. And then when you try and use some of these other alternative ideas, um, like biologicals, compost things we're going to talk about, or this nutrition, when you try to kind of play around with some of these other ideas, you're going to increase the likelihood that they will be effective because you've lowered the disease burden initially just through the design of the farming system by breaking up that diversity, breaking up that monoculture um, with a little bit of diversity. Okay, so that's the argument. So that's why I put that first. I think diversity is our key. And then we can move on to have a think about some of these other strategies um, for those that want to play around with those. Okay, so you'd be all familiar with the disease triangle, the pathogen triangle. It's this idea that says in order for a disease outbreak, we have to have, of course, the, the host plant needs to be present. The pathogen needs to be present. And then it's the right environment. And really, when the environmental conditions are optimized, this is where then the pathogen can cause problems. So you might have the host and the pathogen present. In fact, you always do. The pathogens are always there. You always have pathogens present. Forget this idea that we're using our fungicides and things to create a sterile environment, to kill them, etc. cetera. Um, they're always there. We're, it's really whether or not they are causing disease is the question mark, whether or not they're causing disease at an economic threshold level. But they're always there. It's the environment that will then dictate whether they will be win that competitive edge and whether they will be causing disease. So that's that classic idea of host, pathogen, and environment in this three-way kind of triangle. And this image comes from a really great study earlier this year or review that was really putting the argument saying that the disease triangle is no longer fit for purpose because it complete, I mean, it's not that it's wrong, but it's just not, it's incomplete. It does not consider at all the role and the contribution of the beneficial microbes. The beneficial microbes who, which can also play a role in suppressing that disease or enhancing plant health and plant resilience, plant fitness to help that plant fight off that disease. So the role of the soil microbiome particularly and even the plant microbiome, this is an emerging field of study and research, lots of really good papers looking at this. We now have more and more examples of this is a very complex world, we really don't understand it fully, we're just only beginning to scratch that surface. But what we can see already is some examples where these beneficial microbes can indeed help us. They can also be tools to tip the balance in the favor of the host in these unfavorable environments. There's indeed a four-way interaction. It's not just this simplistic plant-host environment framework. Okay, so let's have a look at some examples of how and why. There's, <clears throat> here's our mechanisms by which biology can help um, the plant. One is just a simple competition. We're just competing, the, the beneficials are competing against the pathogens for space, for nutrients, for real estate, etc., for resources, all of that kind of thing. And it, if the car park is full with all of your cars and someone who's running very late today who didn't turn up um, and they're trying, to get a car, they're trying to get a car park to come and join this party, of course, they can't, okay? We're just compete, we are competing, we're full with beneficials. There's no space for that pathogen to get its foot in the door. That's the mechanism. But then on top of that, many of our beneficials are also, as they grow, they are excreting, as microbes do, they excrete all sorts of compounds into their environment. Many digestive compounds to help break down soil organic matter and carbon and strip nutrients and get nutrients from their environment. They do their digestion externally. And whilst they do that, they also excrete all sorts of other bioactive substances and sometimes substances that help them grow more and substances that suppress others. So the beneficials and pathogens, they're all releasing various biochemicals. It's also a biochemical war that's happening in between their actual bodies. And so the beneficials can produce a lot of these bioactive substances, antifungal, I'm talking about antifungal, antibiotic type substances, and this is called antibiosis, where they're using chemicals, biochemicals, to then have a suppressive effect. Uh, then we have predation. So some beneficials will even prey on pathogens, so consume them, eat them for their own growth and development. Uh, we have a few examples of this. Um, Trichoderma might be one that you're familiar with. It's a predatory fungi. It's a fungus that eats other fungus, so it can eat pathogens digest them and eat them for its growth and development. And then induce resistance. And this is where the beneficial microbes can work with the plant and help trigger immune response in the plant, help the plant turn on its immune system to fight off pests and disease. And we'll talk about that in a second now. So just two quick examples. This is um, this point about resource competition. This is from a really good study showing that plants 
and beneficial microbes, they release uh, a special compound, one of these root exudates or a microbial metabolite, one of their little exudates, called siderophores. And this particular compound is a compound that has a high affinity for iron. And it, it's how plants kind of solubilize iron off the soil and make it available. Plants need iron. Beneficial microbes need iron. Pathogens need iron. We need iron. Livestock need iron. Plants need iron. Everyone needs iron. It's an essential nutrient. And the microbes are the same. They need essential nutrients too. And so what they demonstrated here is that through competition for iron, both in this unique siderophore production, the plants and the beneficial microbes are scavenging all of the iron and inducing a iron deficiency in the pathogen, thereby in limiting its ability to be healthy, to be functional, to cause disease. So through competition, iron is a good example. And here's another one. Um, no rest for resting spores. Can predators mit mitigate club root disease? So here we're looking at um, the fact, the fact that pathogens themselves can be consumed. They are tasty food for some organisms. So things like protozoa or nematodes will actually consume pathogen spores. They will eat them. So when we have beneficials, beneficial microbes or beneficial larger insects and things who are eating the pathogens, um, they are preying on them. We can keep those pathogen levels down, suppressed, below economic thresholds. Again, they're always there, but we're just keeping them um, a little bit down um, thresholds. Okay, so that's really the essence of that discussion. Um, then we have um, this induced resistance and how microbes and things can help the plant. So let's look at the plant's own defense mechanisms, its defense systems. Plants, when they get under attack by diseases um, or pathogens, uh, sorry, uh, diseases or insects, they normally just jump up out of the soil and r use their roots to run away, don't they? <clears throat> of course, they can't do that, so plants have to defend themselves with chemicals. So they internally synthesize defense chemicals, bioactive kind of substances that will be distasteful to insects, suppress insects, or release volatiles that will attract in beneficials, or produce these kind of, again, specific antifungal defense chemicals, protective compounds. So this is how the plant's fight or flight response is to just produce defense chemicals. And that starts um, initially <clears throat> also through just making their skin thicker and tougher. It just starts by thickening up and making the plant's skin more tougher, thicker, um, keeping the pathogens and pests out and protecting the plant inside. So we can have things like cellulose and lignin, structural compounds that can be reinforced in here to thicken up this, but also certain nutrients that get deposited in the cell walls, specifically um, strengthening up the cell walls. So this is physical protection, primary defenses, and that differs from our secondary defenses or biochemical, the internal, the systemic type defenses. And these are those specific chemicals, um, defense chemicals that the plants can synthesize to protect itself. And this, however, in order for the plant to do this, um, it is partly just the plant's own doing. It can produce these defense chemicals, but it also uses the biome in the soil, those soil microbiome. It actually uh, uses, the, draws from those organisms to also help this. So how that happens is that when the pathogen or um, insect attacks, of course the plant detects that, and it will actually send signals down to the roots where it will change its root exudate profile, and it will release very specific chemicals or signals in those root exudates. And these are kind of like a cry for help. These are stress signals that activate and wake up very specific groups of microbes in the soil who respond to that call, who then become active, who then grow. So the, literally those microbes are recruited by the plant through a change in its root exudates, specifically um, sending that stress signal, recruiting and activating certain microbes to then answer that call. And what do those microbes do? They begin to grow around that root system. They'll multiply when they're being fed and receiving that signal. And as they grow around that root system, they then help the plant fight off those attackers through two mechanisms. One is uh, the very fact that, um, as I mentioned, as the microbes grow, they excrete all of these compounds into their environment. So the microbes will actually, in some instances, can synthesize a defense chemical. So it comes from the microbe and the plant will absorb that defense chemical and it can be translocated throughout the rest of the plant. So that's one mechanism. So the defense chemical actually comes from the biome, but just absorbed and translocated throughout the plant. And the second one, which is probably a bit more common, is the microbes, they also again produce their own little chemicals and signals. 
And that signal <clears throat> that they send is detected by the plant roots. And we have some very, very specific examples of this. It's very interesting where the microbe is not actually producing the defense chemical, it's just producing another compound, which is a signaling compound, a return the call, a second kind of signal. And the plant detects that signal and that chemical from the microbe can uniquely switch on specific genes in the plant. Genes that can only be switched on by that chemical, by that microbe. Genes that the plant itself cannot even turn on. And so, which sounds weird, why, if a plant's getting attacked, why wouldn't it just it gets the signal of the attack, why doesn't it just turn on the production of that defense chemical? Clearly it can't, the microbe holds the key. I don't, why would this do this? We can only assume microbes and plants have been through millions of years of evolution. This is probably a partition of labor. So the plants are, well, you can keep those keys. I've got enough I've got to deal with. So, um, and I don't need that key all of the time. I don't need this defense chemical. It's only if I'm under attack. So the biome, the soil biome exists, of course, in vast, vast genetic diversity, huge amount of biodiversity that exists amongst the bacteria and fungi, et cetera, in that soil biome. In fact, the most biodiverse ecosystem on the entire planet, right here in soil. And in that diversity is embedded all sorts of really cool and fascinating genes that microbes hold, and those genes code for these types of chemicals or signals, these types of things. So we have examples where then that signal in return is what will trigger the expression of a gene in the plant that codes for the production of that defense chemical, which is then translocated throughout the plant uh, in order to protect it. Okay, so that's then the essence of the discussion about plants' own immunity. Plants can fight off disease. Uh, microbes can also help to suppress. And if we can integrate all of these tools together, um, it's overall can be, part, can be part of an integrated strategy. Now, however, in order for the plant to produce these defense chemicals, the plants also need not just the microbes and the signals, the plants also need essential nutrients. They need nutrients to build those defense chemicals. They need nutrients to grow, to prime photosynthesis. They need essential macro and micronutrients to make this function. It's not just about signals, although that's part of it. You've also got to have the stuff to make the chemicals, the actual building blocks. So if we look at how plants grow to start with, and you'll all appreciate this in the context of generally production, you're trying to help plants grow to produce, to be high yielding, etc. You need essential nutrients for this. And it starts with photosynthesis. I mentioned at the beginning, CO2, breathing in that CO2, taking out water. And then we have C, H, and O, the building blocks to build sugar, glucose, the very first product of photosynthesis, plus oxygen. But this doesn't just happen miraculously. There are specific nutrients that act as part of enzymes or catalysts. An enzyme is just a catalyst in a biological thing, system. So these are catalysts. These are catalyzing this process. Without the essential nutrients, photosynthesis doesn't necessarily just happen on itself. It needs special tools, special catalysts to make it work. So for example, it, the plant needs to build chlorophyll. Photosynthesis, photosynthesis happens in chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is made up of magnesium and nitrogen. And the plant needs iron. Iron is not part of the molecule, but it is involved in building the molecule. So we need magnesium, we need nitrogen, and we need iron for chlorophyll production, the site of photosynthesis. The plant also needs manganese to kind of split water to make use of that HNO. And then we need phosphorus for energy to drive this whole process. So for example, those certain nutrients are key for this primary photosynthesis, just to get the sugar, turn that gas carbon into chemical carbon, something physical energy. Then the plant takes that building block, that simple sugar molecule, and miraculously, through what's called then secondary metabolism, it turns that sugar into all sorts of other fascinating and amazing compounds. In fact, everything, anything and everything that the plant is made up of exclusively comes first from sugar. But the plant will stitch that sugar together to make long chain sugars and carbohydrates and stitch all these together to make tough cellulose and lignin. And when it goes to bolting and going to produce that seed head, it has to make all this lignin to make a tough stalk to hold that seed head. Again, it all comes from just simple sugars stitched together and linked up or reshaped and made into different shapes and sizes, etc. Uh, similarly, we could reshape the carbon, plug in a nitrogen, plug in a sulfur, build amino acids. We talked about them earlier. They are just nitrogen and carbon. They're organic nitrogen molecules, so we're plugging together carbon and nitrogen, building amino acids, then we stitch them together to build proteins, that was as we talked about earlier, but on and on. 
anything else. The waxes, that cuticle layer, layer that's kind of waxes and oils that the plant is making. Um, those defense chemicals that we just talked about, other smells and scents, colors, flavors, pigments, absolutely anything, root exudates, and again, these defense chemicals, anything and everything that the plant is made up of, either structurally, its body, or internally, metabolically, the stuff in the sap, these chem defense chemicals, etc. These also depend on essential nutrients acting as catalysts, macro and micronutrients acting as catalysts to turn building block into much more useful and functional things. So point being, if you have a deficiency of all of your macro and micronutrients, this will be limited. You will not optimize production, which you're all interested in, but equally you will not optimize the production of specific defense chemicals or plant immunity. And that's the essence of the argument. So when we have a nutritional deficiency, we're not producing the right defense chemicals and therefore plant immunity can be limited. So practically speaking, how do we manage this? This is where tools like plant analysis or sap analysis are then important to identify what are our missing nutrients, what do we need, um, what is limiting in the plant, which may be contributing to the weakening of that plant immune system. Okay, and then to the question we did have earlier, it's a really big question about sap analysis and how best to do this. It's kind of a big topic. Um, I really value the SAP analysis. I value standard tissue analysis too. I think they're both great tools. They can help you diagnose what the issues are. They're also all imperfect. They are not perfect tools at all. They have strengths and weaknesses. But again, they're a guide. I think they're better than nothing um, to identify what those limitations are. And then the foliar applications are one way in which we can rapidly correct foliar uh, nutrient deficiencies. If you identify a deficiency in the analysis, liquid solution applied onto the foliage can get that nutrient into the plant as quickly as possible, far quicker than soil root up, um, entry, uh, in order to then deliver the, the missing nutrient or the imbalanced nutrient to drive photosynthesis, to drive defense chemical production, or to drive protein, what, you know, whatever it is your, your goal kind of that you're chasing is. Okay, and that's the that's the essence. And then, yes, there's real specifics under that on, okay, what nutrient, what form of the nutrient, what concentration to apply, what time of the day to apply it, what to mix in. Like, there's all of those kind of really specific things. You'll find some information on that if you search me for YouTube. I do have some talks on this where I've talked about some of those things. Do you know, have you got any, do you know of any decent papers or actual research? I can't find any decent sort of folio reports or uh, we did some trials and these are the reports. Uh, for like looking at uh, the effectiveness of foliar sprays and yeah, things? Or, yeah, yeah. Did a trial on wheat or barley or bicobbing or whatever. This is what we applied, this is what we found. Yeah, there's lots. Um, so I would say like ge the general idea of foliar nutrition, the foliar applied nutrients, there's um, lots and lots of studies on this. Um, uh, you could even go down to specifics on finding it on the, your crop of interest. I would say there's, there's lots out there. Um, maybe not specifically done in this climate or this exact context always, but the general idea of foliar applied nutrients, I would say is very well researched. Um, uh, but yeah, you'd have to, yeah, maybe we'd have to go down into more specifics underneath that. But, uh, but yes, I would say the, the, the concept of foliar applied nutrients is very well researched, um, but I agree there's still gap, knowledge gaps. I think there's really important things that we Many of those studies, and I've looked into lots of them. I could, if you want to send me an email, I could like dig some up for you on specific crops that you might be interested in, but or plants. But you will find some plenty on there. Oh yeah, I, I was going to say that I, I've looked into a lot of those, and there are lots of specifics about the spray tank and what goes in and the water quality. These variables and the spray pH, these variables are all very important, and often in the studies they really don't mention this at all. It's not considered. Um, there's no really talk about what the water quality is like or if they're including wetter stickers. It's kind of a little, sometimes they do, but not always. And I think that this is part of the reason that foliars may generally have a bit of a mixed view amongst people. Some really think that they're very valuable tools. Some people think they're a waste of time. And I think that part of that um, d the divergence there is um, a little bit of this kind of what I call the spray and pray approach. It's like, well, okay, here's a deficiency. Let's put the nutrients in the spray tank and go. You've got to put a lot of intentional thought into what goes into that spray. I mean, carbon additives, adjuvant, temperature, pH, et cetera, et cetera. Like a lot of variables are important. And then what time of the day you apply it. You need high humid conditions for good uptake. And sometimes there's a lot of specifics here that we do know about that are also well-researched. But I also see in a lot of the studies, they often are not 
factoring these types of things in. It's not part of the consideration. I think that is partly uh, one of the reasons for maybe mixed results and mixed views. I think there's very little UK research on that. I think. There's some European <clears throat> research, which we like to think lies from work done on nitrogen, Really much significant difference between solid and solid liquid. So it's just one <laughs> yeah. situation, one sure, sure, yeah. One the, piece of research, and you know, there's been a lack now of good research in this country for the last mm -hmm. 30 years. Mm -hmm. Do you want to come and do some research in my place? That'd be fine. <laughs> sure. Uh, sure. Yeah, and I would agree with that general sentiment. I think we all know that, um, and this is true in many countries around the world, that many of our research organizations and authorities have been <coughs> gone through that process of cutback, sizing down, privatizing, um, you know, um, um, hiring out some of those research services so that, for example, governments don't have to do it themselves. Yeah. It's Mm, yeah, okay, yeah, sure, also. We're yeah. just looking to put some meat with the jelly now with bringing an independent nutrition to know meat with the app after Christmas, and uh, probably a form of probably the tin pot is actually meat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you'd be surprised. There's lots of research on folias. Um, I'm sure there's lots here in the UK. I, 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 earlier this year, I ran an online course on folia nitrogen. And in that, I specifically looked into a lot of research on this very specific topic. And I would agree with your sentiment. There's a lot of mixed results out there. And many studies say that it's not so effective. There's many that say that it is and can be. And I kind of summarized some of, that, um, some of those findings. And it's um, uh, in, in that core series. And that was really the summation of what my kind of comment there earlier was, is that from wading through those papers and really digging into this, that was my feeling, is that there's a lot of mixed variables that people do and don't account for. And I think this is producing a lot of mixed results. That was basically my feeling from kind of digging through those. But so, OK, um, this idea then um, about nutrients helping plant immunity and nutrients being able to support plant immunity to make it um, resistant to pests and disease. I think in many agricultural circles, this would probably sound like a bit more of a fringe idea. The idea that nutrients can manage plants, help plants manage pests and disease themselves through optimized nutrition. Some, some of you might think that's a bit more of an out there fringe idea or maybe only something um, that we see amongst maybe um, organic farmers, etc. Um, but I just, I'll have a slide coming up here in a second to say that um, there are many, many studies that support this idea. Okay, and I'm going to share just a small selection with you um, just a second. And don't, I was just sorry, looping back a little bit here, sorry, jumping ahead of myself. Um, just to say that if we talk about insect resistance and the ability of the plant to produce defense chemicals that, insects are, deter that are deterrent to insects, it's again the same process of photosynthesis. Um, but again, we're just going to turn that building block into different things. Anti-feed and anti-herbivory compounds that upset the digestive system of the stomach, or these cell strengtheners thickening up the cells, the barriers of the plant. And it's the same for disease. It's still the same building block from primary photosynthesis. We're just going to turn it into antibiotic, antifungal type things. Okay? This is the mechanism of plant nutrition. And this idea that deficient plants have therefore are weakened and become more susceptible to pest and disease is very, very well studied in the literature. There is, the idea is sound. When you have a deficient organism, us, plants, animals, if we are deficient in key nutrients that we need to function, of course, our health, our immunity will suffer. And there are many, this is a small, small selection, there are many, many papers establishing the link between nutritional deficiency and greater pest and disease pressure. The real challenge, this is not the idea in the core of itself, the real challenge is the practical application of this knowledge. I think the, the evidence base is robust. We have plenty of good evidence to support this. The challenge, I will acknowledge, is translating that into field conditions. Like your question, what do I apply? At what timing? At what concentration? What else has to go in? On which crop? Et cetera, et cetera. There are knowledge gaps there for sure, I do acknowledge, and it is the practical translation that we have to really, really work on. It's not the idea that nutrients can help plants. It's how we do this at scale in practice. I think this is much more the important point. Just as an example, here we have a review paper on this. So again, a paper reviewing 
lots of those other studies. Just ch cherry picking out some examples here. Um, when there is high nitrogen, there is increased severity of the infection. Potassium can decrease the susceptibility of the host plants. Manganese can control many diseases because of its role in lignin biosynthesis and phenol synthesis, which phenols are one of these defense chemicals. Um, boron found to reduce the severity of many diseases because of boron gets deposited in those cell walls. And silicon also um, helps to control many diseases through creating a physical barrier in those cell walls, but also fueling some of the internal defense chemical production. Mm. So if I summarize some of that literature into one slide for you, I would say that these are the key players. I would argue that a deficiency of any nutrient in one way or another is not going to be helping the plant to do whatever it's trying to do. So I think we, it's fair to say that you kind of consider everything, but more specifically, nutrients that we have a very direct evidence on their role and their benefit in this. For that cell strengthening benefit that I talked about, it's calcium, silicon, and boron. All three of those deposit in those cell walls, making them tougher, thicker, more robust, harder for pathogens, etc., insects to get through. So it'll be those three. For some of those structural, the lignin biosynthesis that I talked about, it's manganese, it's copper, and again, boron. So these three are very important. So those top five nutrients are very important for physical defenses, primary, toughening up the skin of the plant. And this is your first line of defense. So if you want to be proactive about pest and disease management, make sure that you have adequate amounts of these nutrients in the plant. And I'm not saying you have to apply them, but you have to make sure that they are there in adequate amounts. If they're adequate, they're adequate. If there's a deficiency, then yes, apply. But I'm not saying you have to necessarily always just be applying them, but these are the ones to look out for. In terms of some of those internal systemic chemicals, again, it's silicon is very important here, manganese, sulfur. There's probably, a, I could probably put quite a few extra on that list, but maybe these are kind of the more the main ones. Sulfur, again, you, you, as we mentioned earlier, the brassicas are sulfur rich plants. They have um, that biofumigant effect, so it's because they have lots of these sulfur based biochemicals that have very suppressive effects. So um, sulfur would be an important nutrient to help the plant synthesize these sulfur-based defense chemicals. And then nitrogen management. And um, this is the kind of the last one we'll, we'll, we'll um, kind of wrap this discussion up on, on terms of nutrition. Um, and it's this problem of excess nitrogen. Uh, we, of course, value nitrogen fertilizer as an important nutrient that helps to drive production. That's why we apply it. We all know it does a really good job at increasing yield. But we do also have some evidence that highlights that this, at the same time, can be undermining plant health, specifically plant immunity and its ability, its attractiveness to, to pests and disease. And this is a really good um, paper that kind of summarizes the evidence that support this idea. Um, and they kind of outline these principles here. Uh, it's called, you can find an open copy of this one if you like. Um, when medicine feeds the problem, do nitrogen fertilizers and pesticides enhance the nutritional quality of crops for their pests and pathogens? And um, they basically lay out the argument that says when we have too much nitrogen, this ultimately can lead to an increased, um, and there's a nuance here. They kind of frame it in the word excess nitrogen. I would be a little more nuanced in my ch ch choice of word, and I would say imbalanced nitrogen rather than excess. But what they're saying is that that excess nitrogen can lead to an accumulation of amino acids, free amino acids, which makes the plant more attractive to pest and disease. Now, this is the reason being, is that amino acids, you would have heard this phrase before, amino acids are the building block of life. They are the organic molecules that, are the, that we stitch together to form all of these different specific proteins. We talked about this earlier with nitrogen metabolism. They are the building blocks, and living things turn them into proteins, and proteins are all sorts of important and functional things that organisms need to, to grow. Uh, us as humans, we eat food and we extract amino acids as building blocks and we use those to build our bodies, human proteins, proteins that humans need. Plants take the same amino acids but they turn them into different things that plants need, plant proteins. Bacteria, they also eat amino acids and they build their bacterial bodies, bacterial proteins, same with fungi. We're all competing for amino acids, same with livestock, same with everything. We all have a requirement for the building blocks of life but we then just do different things with them. We make humans, they make bacteria, they make insects, et cetera, et cetera. And this is the argument is that when we accumulate excess amino acids in the plant, this is, becomes more attractive to those pests and disease because they, they have an amino acid requirement. And it comes back to this discussion here, is that 
I wouldn't say it's excess nitrogen. I would say it's imbalanced nitrogen, meaning excess nitrogen in relation to these other synergistic nutrients, especially the ones on this list. Because if you have an accumulation of free amino acids, it means you're not finishing the metabolic pathway. You've obviously got some barrier here, some limitation here. Once you stitch those amino acids together and build more complex and complete proteins, this is what the insects cannot digest. And they're things that the insects are not so interested in. They want their building blocks to make their own proteins. That's what they're chasing. So insects, therefore, are more attracted to plants that have a lot of free amino acids in them. And those plants have a lot of free amino acids, not just because we might have overapplied nitrogen, but because we then didn't finish converting that nitrogen into complex and complete proteins. So for me, it signals more of this imbalance point that there is a limitation in some nutrients here that is um, in a not finishing the, the protein synthesis um, job. Okay, so that's the essence of the idea um, that they lay out and um, suggesting that um, excess nitrogen undermines this process, making the plants more attractive to insects and disease. They also talk about the contribution of pesticides in this discussion, that pesticides are also a, induce a stress response in the plant. And I think many of you probably would have seen this before if you apply a selective herbicide, for example, or a fungicide to a crop, um, to a plant, it often will be a bit unhappy for a few days, it might go a bit yellow or just stop growing or a bit unhappy for a day or two, and then it kind of pulls out of that and it's fine. And what's going on there is a stress response to the exposure to that chemical. Now, of course, a fungicide is not going to kill a plant. It's a fungus, right? It affects fungus. It's not going to kill the plant, but it's still a foreign alien chemical inside the plant, which the plant doesn't really love and it will detoxify it. It's not going to kill it, but it will, break it, it will have to break it down and detoxify. And in order for the plant to break down and detoxify after the application of our pesticides, in order for it to do that, it has to build special proteins, detox proteins. And these are special proteins, enzymes, things that come along and cut up that pesticide to break it down, to detoxify. So the plant has to manufacture these detox proteins. That's the stress response that we see for a few days. We are detox, detox, and then we move on. Now, in order for the plant to produce those detox proteins, the stress response of the pesticide exposure, therefore, can trigger a process of protein breakdown so, or protein catabolism. So the plant will break down proteins, its storage proteins, things that it has. It will break them down to liberate the amino acids, which are the building blocks, and it will then restitch those amino acids to build the detox proteins. So we trigger a protein breakdown stress response in order to build the detox protein to detox and then keep moving on. And so that's, again, what the argument is laid out in that paper, that the stress response from pesticides actually induces a process of breakdown, liberating free amino acids, thereby potentially making that plant more attractive to pests and disease because of the accumulation um, of, the, uh, of those free amino acids. So there's a bit more to it than, than that. That's kind of I'm summarizing the, the key um, essence there. There's also a big discussion about how um, excess nitrogen changes some of the production of those internal defense chemicals. There's a bit more to the story, but that's really the, the key essence of that discussion. So uh, again, I would add the caveat that it is not excess nitrogen, it is imbalanced nitrogen nitrogen in relation to those other nutrients that help it do its job. I think this is more so the, the point. Okay, so in a nutshell, I think we could summarize here and say that um, in order to help these biologicals and microbes and things, which can be a bit variable, um, inconsistent, in order to help them do a better job at helping to suppress pathogens and, um, uh, and help the plant, um, we've got to make their job easier by designing with diversity first. Get, start on the right step. In terms of this idea of spraying some manganese or boron or this or that or whatever, which is also a bit imperfect, it seems to definitely have good evidence on this, um, maybe don't have quite all the practicals nutted out yet. Um, in order to make best use of this imperfect tool, it also helps if we have design with diversity to begin with, to then bring these tools together so that they have more chance of doing the job for us collectively. Spreading, hedging the bets, not putting all the eggs in one basket, we're hedging the bets here. Using, integrating many different tools in the toolbox, that's what I integrated pest and disease management is. And that's the point. We bring together imperfect tools, 
but when we use those imperfect tools in an environment that has been designed to be less conducive to pest and disease spread in the first place, of course they're going to do a better job because there's a lower baseline of initial pressure. And, uh, and that's, the, that's the essence of the discussion. So we want to integrate many tools. That's the, really the idea. They all have strengths and weaknesses. There is no silver bullet. We've got to integrate all of these together. Design with diversity. Start on the right foot. Break up the susceptibility of those monotonous monocultures. Biologicals, they can then add that extra layer of um, protection through microbial diversity and how those microbes synthesize these defense chemicals themselves and suppress pathogens, etc., or also help the plant fuel its own immune system. But in order for the plant to fuel its immune system, it needs those specific nutrients, particularly things like calcium, silicon, boron, manganese, copper, um, zinc, nitrogen, managing nitrogen accordingly, uh, as we just talked about, sulfur, for example. So we want to then optimize the nutritional supply um, with those biologicals with the diversity and here we have an integrated package that is then going to help us reduce our dependency on those pesticides. The key thing we have to do is use them as least as possible. It is when we overuse pesticides that we accelerate the development of resistance. So if you want that tool to maintain its longevity and its effectiveness then the best thing you can do is not use it. And the only way you're going to use it is to integrate other, what might be considered more alternative and fringe ideas. I would argue that now these alternative fringe and ideas need to be front and center because they will be the key to helping us preserve the effectiveness of our pesticides, to, to use them as least as possible to integrate these other alternative strategies. And that's really the argument. Um, and that's also great if we're using less pesticides in the first place. It's all win-win. Okay, those are tools that we should use when we absolutely only really need them. They should be the last tool in the, in the box. We bring all the others out first, and when we, I'm not gonna stand back here and say, look, if you've got a suffering crop absolutely riddled with disease, and just to say, well, no, don't use a pesticide, um, you should try all this or that, whatever. Like, if that crop, crop is on its last legs, okay, use these emergency tools when we really need them. But we start as a foundation with all of these other integrated strategies so that we keep those tools in the, in the pantry and um, only bring them out when absolutely needed. And I think that that is the point, is that in order for them to maintain their effectiveness, we have to lean on some of these other strategies. And again, I acknowledge there are some knowledge gaps. We have practical gaps here. So I'm not saying I have all the answers. I absolutely don't. We have to do this as a collective community, and it's great that events like these are happening and these monitor farm type events where we can meet on farm and learn from other farmers and come peer to peer, etc. I think this is all critical to help us fill in some more of those those knowledge gaps. Okay, thank you very much.